Good evening from Money Matters TV. I'm Paul Sloat, CEO of Green Drake Partners, and with me tonight as my co-host is Charlie Shields of Wells Fargo Advisors. A little later, we'll be talking with Patricia Dunn of the Dunn Group at Merrill Lynch. She had the honor of being the first woman at Merrill Lynch in Philadelphia. Good evening, Charlie. Good to see you. Well, how you been? Good. How Good. have you been? Fine. No complaints. No complaints. I guess there's no complaints about the market either. It keeps hitting new highs. That's right. We're not supposed to time the market, but things are good right now. Things are good. So the government seems to be concerned with high-frequency trading these days. Yeah, I think uh, we need to talk to our viewers and listeners about that. There might have been a problem five years ago, and now a book has recently come out flagging this as an issue about the time as I think it's getting solved. Uh, the way I see it, uh, 60 Minutes had a segment that showed this guy recognized the problem, spent a long time thinking about it, slowed down his trades, routed them in different directions, and he solved the problem. And now everybody's getting all worried about it, and the individual investor is getting the wrong message to think that it's not a fair game out there. What do you think? What do I think? Well, I don't really know enough about the issue to have an opinion. I know there was a period of time where there was an advantage to high-frequency trading. I don't know whether that's been arbitraged away. Mm -hmm. As the market being efficient does, typically yeah. when there is some kind of anomaly, over time it gets arbitraged away. So maybe you could explain a little bit to our viewers what the problem was, and is probably as typical, once it hits the front page of the paper, the problem's already over. Sure. Uh, well, obviously there was a dramatic event several years ago where the market went down 1,000 points, and then it came back 700 points in the next 10 minutes, and that was called the flash crash. And so what had actually happened was a lot of these big, huge outfits were building their computer systems closer and closer to Wall Street to get an early advantage on where the flow of trades was going. And there were several of these giants trying to do the same thing at once. And all of their computers said to sell. And then all of a sudden, stocks, some st stocks went from 40 down to zero and then closed that day at 39, that type of thing. So obviously, there was a serious problem at that time. And we've gradually worked our way back where, as you say, the People s saw this opportunity to make this million dollars in milliseconds and, and slowly but surely they're starting to fix it. I don't think they're ever going to have to declare it illegal because I, I think the opportunity is going to be gone shortly anyway. But that's beyond my pay grade to know the answer to that question. Yeah, and if in a way the flash crash almost reminds me of the 87 crash, which was also computer driven where we had the futures and people were actually shorting the stocks against the futures as the futures went down and eventually the SEC put circuit breakers in place that basically solved the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what's been done here. Yes. So why don't we talk a little bit about things that the market might be concerned about. The Fed's gone along with tapering. Yep. And tapering should end later this year, which means sometime next year they're going to start raising short-term rates. So what do you think is going to happen, and how quickly do you think the Fed's going to raise rates? Well, uh, everyone thought that Janet Yellen made, quote, a rookie mistake, unquote, when she said six months after the end of tapering, which sort of accelerated the time that rates would be uh, pushed up. And I don't think that she made a mistake. Uh, I have a feeling she's trying to get the market aware of the fact that the economy may be recovering faster than we expect right now, and she doesn't want this, the market to be caught by surprise if six months after the end of tapering, she starts raising short-term rates. How do you feel about that? Well, we think that the economy is actually stronger than the data would say. Uh, we see capital spending picking up this year. We see the housing industry continuing its recovery. Had this little trade-off from investors to homeowners, and you had a big price rise. So you rationed out sort of the lower end of the market, mm -hmm. so they're not there to buy houses. But as incomes go up and employment gets better and wage rates have started to accelerate, the ho housing market should start to pick up. And you've also had a little bit, I call it a price shock. Yeah. So people are looking all of a sudden at costing them 30% more to buy the same house than mm -hmm. two years ago. And so you got a little hesitancy on the part of the buyers. But I don't see housing prices going down at all. In fact, rents just went up 3% in the first quarter. And as long as rents continue to go, housing is going to look as a good alternative. 
So I think that, you know, the housing market will start to recover again later this year. Certainly by the first half of next year, capital spending is going to pick up. State and local spending is picking up. And the federal government, which had the biggest contraction in 2013 since the Korean War, it was about 2.5% of GDP. People don't realize that. Mm -hmm. That contraction this year may be 1% to 1.5%. So if the underlying economy was growing 4 4 4.5%, we could easily grow three, three and a half percent this year. Yeah. And if because there's a election coming up in a couple of years, Congress starts to loosen the purse strings, you could be looking at four or five percent growth in 2015, which would certainly justify the Fed raising rates earlier and faster than people think. And I actually think it would be a good thing if they started to raise rates as soon as they really need to, because inflation would be the thing we'll need to worry about if they don't raise rates when they need to. Well, I think that's uh, the thought, especially because with QE, there's a tremendous amount of money, trillions of dollars actually, that are not circulating in the banking system. Mm -hmm. And so you've got about, uh, according to the Federal Reserve itself, about two and a half trillion dollars in excess reserves sitting at the banks. And if that starts to circulate in the economy, even a little bit of that using a normal multiplier, you could really get some inflation in the economy. I agree. So it's likely Janet Yellen was not kidding. And I think that the issue that people forget about Janet is if you go back to the 90s when she was also on the Federal Reserve, she was involved in some of the interest rate hikes back in the 90s. So she's not the dove I think most people think. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It will certainly be interesting. Now, we haven't talked about this in a while, but why don't we talk about the three vigilantes and in inflation because with the Fed raising rates, that's one of the things I think they're going to be looking at. Yeah, I, I, I like to uh, focus on three different aspects to give me an early warning if inflation is going to come back. Gold, which of course got to 1900 back a couple of years ago, is now as we speak somewhere around the 1200 area. And uh, if, if it goes back through 1400, uh, then that's going to tell me to watch out that that's a, one of the little yellow caution flags warning you to watch out for inflation. The 30-year bond, I'm expecting the 30-year bond yield to climb from below 4 up toward 5 percent as the economy recovers over the next couple of years. But if we start seeing, if, if Yellen is slow to raise rates and we start seeing that 30-year bond going through 5 percent headed north, that will worry me about inflation. And the dollar, if we're not doing the right things, the dollar will start to drop out of the bottom of the trading zone it's been in. So those are the three vigilantes I look at. And, and, you know, the thing about the dollar is we've had this big currency, I call it the race to the bottom. Yeah. Right? So we had, you know, depreciation by the emerging markets. Then we had the U.S. depreciate the dollar. Now we've had Japan depreciate the yen. And now it looks like Germany, because they compete a lot against Japan is now talking about allowing the euro, the, the ECB, to increase money supply, which would allow the euro to sort of soften a bit. Yeah. So they'd be joining the race to the bottom. So, yeah, we could have more inflation, especially if maybe Janet thought that in order for the dollar to stay competitive and the U.S. to stay competitive globally, we'd have to let the dollar soften in real terms. Yeah. So we could get inflation. But we're competing with other people that want to keep their currency down, so that'll be an interesting battle to watch. Right. Whether she falls on the side of inflation or whether she falls on the side of keeping us competitive globally. Yeah. So it's something to watch. We won't really know till 2015 or 2016. Yeah. So the party will continue for the next few months anyway. For at least the next few months. <laughs> All right. So... The other thing that uh, we have, we have a market at record highs, but earnings growth has actually been slowing. Is this a worry for the market? Well, it's, I think you have to be more careful. Uh, if, you, if you bought just about any stock in 2009, you've made quite a bit of money because just about every stock has gone up. Now I think you do have to look at individual companies and make sure what do they do? Are they selling a lot overseas where uh, certainly overseas stocks are behind the U.S. right now? And so if there's going to be demand overseas for a product, that will help a corporation. If they're doing everything inside the U.S. and the price to earnings is high 
and the growth in that particular company is slowing, you've got to be very careful of that type of stock. So I have to say it depends. What's your answer? Well, our answer, and we recently wrote a piece on this, is that we've gone from being a stock market to being a market of stocks, okay. which in a way mirrors exactly what you said, which is careful security selection will do well this year. And in fact, we gave our uh, readers and, and investors an example of two companies we owned, one we owned last year and one we owned this year, and the difference in performance since January 1 through when we wrote the letter in the middle of March was one of the companies which we had sold in 2013 was actually down about 15 to 17 percent, while the other stock was up about 10 to 15 percent, and they're basically in the same business. Yeah. So I think you have to be really careful about security selection at this point because valuation in the market is not forgiving. Fair enough. Okay. So what do you think about bonds now for your clients, and how are you handling the bond side of the equation? I'm keeping the maturities uh, in fairly tight. Intermediate-term bonds I think are okay. I'm getting more comfortable with municipal tax-free bonds than I was. Uh, I still am worried about uh, where the 10-year and 30-year U.S. government bond will go once the Fed has completely stopped with their tapering. They've been masking what's going on, and they've artificially kept rates low. And we don't know how high they will rise. And if the economy does accelerate, as you and I are seeming to agree it will, then long-term rates could rise, and that can really hurt long-term bond investors. Yeah, I would agree. We've told our, our clients to avoid any type of bond fund because that's probably going to be one of the worst places to be. And we have them have advised them to be in sort of the same as you, sort of intermediate durations and typical ladders. And as rates go up, we've looked at this and we've looked a little bit at the math of what will happen as a five-year bond becomes a four-year bond, becomes a three-year bond mm -hmm. over time. And, and what we think is going to happen is clients will kind of break even from a principal perspective on the actual bond okay. and they'll collect their coupon. Because it'll just become a shorter maturity, and even though rates are going up, the fact that the maturity is shortening enough is going to decrease the duration enough so that they, it's going to offset the rise in interest So at least rates. they'll do a little better than money market. They'll yeah. do a little better than money market, yeah. but I don't think they're going to do much better. Yeah, I agree. So outside of stocks and bonds, are there any other areas that you're looking at for your clients? Well, the, the inflation question tells me when we're going to want to enter commodities. Uh, I have not been interested in commodities the last two or three years, but they're starting to get interesting to me. So if you thought inflation would pick up, let's say, in 2015, 2016, then you would advocate that the, your clients put a portion of their money into some kind of commodity or real asset type investment. Agree. And then the viewer quest question will bring up another topic that I wanted to uh, discuss. Well, why don't we dis discuss the viewer right. question right now. Uh, the viewer question this month comes from Gary Justin of Hatboro, PA. And his question is, are we going to have a trade problem with China? Well, my short answer is, I don't think so. I think it's going to work itself out. I mean, sure. We're, we're going to be vying with them to get a competitive advantage. I don't really believe that it's in either country's interest to start trade barriers and that sort of thing. Uh, the old McDonald's theory, there's never been a war between two countries that both have a McDonald's. And, uh, for example, the, the Japanese are not going to be bombing the, the U.S. car plants because they own them. And China and the U.S. are getting more and more entangled financially. So I'm not too worried about... Uh, how we're going to get along with China. It'll be interesting to watch, but I think it'll smooth itself out over the next 20 or 30 years. Okay. And if you want to ask a question, feel free to write to Money Matters TV, 205 East Levering Mill Road, Bala Kinwood, PA, 19004, or email us at moneymatterstv at gmail.com. And now it's time for our guest. Our guest tonight is Patricia Dunn of Merrill Lynch. Good evening, Pat. Good evening, Paul. So how are you tonight? I am terrific. You're terrific. <laughs> I bet. Okay. Well, that's great. 
So we've seen this transition or we're in the midst of this transition from in the financial services industry from let's say portfolio management to wealth management. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what the difference is and then what this means for the average person and what it means for maybe the financial services industry. Great. Um, let's start first with where this idea came from. And I think that really this originated from the fact that we had two bear markets within a single decade. And this was more than just about watching your portfolio lose value. This rocked investors to their core. We had uh, retirements postponed. We had whole careers that were downsized. And the whole concept of how to climb the corporate ladder changed dramatically. And I think that this idea bubbled up from both the investors and the professionals who served them because they realized that the traditional conversation between an investor and their advisor, that is, how did I do, how did my portfolio perform versus the benchmark, had become an exercise in frustration. In 2008, the S&P 500, as you know, lost 37%. When the investor asked their advisor, well, how did I do? And the advisor said, oh, Paul, you did great. Your portfolio was only down 25%. You beat the benchmark. It was an accurate statement, but it didn't give comfort to anyone. Mm -hmm. So instead, the conversation had to change. It had to go from how did I do to how am I doing? Because at the end of the day, money has a purpose. It has a job to do. And so how am I doing in getting funded towards this objective that I'm trying to achieve became the more realistic and practical question to ask. And it put both the investor and their advisor in a position where they could control the controllable. You and I can't control whether markets go up or down. But if we know the, keep our focus on what is the end objective for this money, we can measure how much progress have they made toward the goal or how much did this volatility set them back? And then again, what do we need to do to get back on track? All right, Pat, uh, with that in mind, help our viewers and listeners think about what quality should they be looking for in a wealth management advisor as, as opposed to E-Trade or Ameritrade or whoever they're thinking about doing their trades with? Excellent question. Because this is all new since the two bear markets in a decade, not every pro financial professional is on board with the change yet. Mm -hmm. So from an investor point of view, looking to hire someone to work with them, I would say start with what is their title? Is their title financial advisor or is their title wealth management advisor? But don't stop there because titles can be deceiving. I would look next for credentials. If it's a sole practitioner, are they a certified financial planner? Or if it's a team approach, is there a certified financial planner on the team? And then finally, if you're really serious about inter interviewing this person to work with, I'd ask for an initial meeting. And then keep your ears open during the initial meeting to see how comprehensive the questions are that you're being asked regarding your needs, your wants, and your dreams. Because if all the questions seem to revolve around your portfolio and not your life, then chances are they're still in the thought process of how did I do rather than how am I doing. Hmm. Very interesting distinguishment. So given that and given the change in maybe how you're going to look at the advisor, how does the me as the novice coming in to see the wealth management person understand how they're going to customize basically for my own risk appetite and my own dreams and how do I judge whether they really can do that? Very good question Paul. Um, 
When you're going to sit down and work with such a person, I would say the best way to do that is to work with them, to be open and honest about your goals, about your concerns, about your assets, and about your liabilities. But I wouldn't stop there. I would say you really need to go forward and discuss with this individual what potentially disruptive issues could come up to ruin the plan. For example, you know, you could be working with your advisor diligently towards building a retirement lifestyle to which you'd like to become accustomed and have the whole plan ruined because suddenly there are aging parents who are relying on you for their own financial stability. If these potentially disruptive events are out in the open, they can be planned for, and oftentimes contingency planning can negate surprises. Hmm. Uh, the different people have different levels of risk, and a lot of times they don't even know what their risk tolerance is until a 2008 comes along. <laughs> so how do you get off on the right foot with a client to make sure you're going to really know what their risk tolerance is and, and get them prepared for what might happen? Very good question. Any good advisor takes the time to really understand the investor. And it's not just their risk tolerance, it's also their investment personality mm -hmm. as well as their time horizons because different objectives have different time horizons. And I believe that you have to have a handle on all three, the investment personality, the tolerance for risk, and the time horizon in order to put together a strategy that meets all three. And that's fundamental to establishing an essential partnership relationship with your professional. So you've established this partnership with the professional and you're looking to make progress towards goals. How are the investment decisions handled? How much input does the investor have, how much input does the advisor have, how collaborative is the process, you know, how solution oriented are all the different pieces that need to be fit together. Paul, you just said the whole thing in a nutshell. Let's go back. I said one of the key elements to wealth management is the creation of strategies that meet the client's life goals. With the client's life goals in mind, the wealth manager may recommend to the particular investor one strategy or multiple strategies. For example, you could have one strategy to provide for tuition expenses needed in four years and a totally different strategy for funding retirement in 20 years at a lifestyle of X. Now the investor is always in control and because they're always in control, this is a collaborative relationship, they are free to say yes or no to any given strategy. But understand that a strategy discussion is a whole lot bigger than which stock to buy and which stock to sell. And the wealth manager has to always take into consideration the risk tolerance of the individual they're working with. So I see wealth managers distinguishing himself, herself on their ability to truly understand the goals of the client, the risk tolerance of the client, and be able to have strategies that are aligned with those objectives. This is an ongoing relationship and it's something where there's periodic updates to measure what has been the progress to date. Quite often I find that clients don't really know how much money they are spending and how much they're going to have to spend in retirement. Uh, do you have a process that help them to get a handle on that or at least be aware of how their progress is toward making sure they'll have enough? Exactly. Um, of course, the client statement is always a wonderful tool okay? <laughs> because it shows money in, money out, money earned, money lost. Yeah. But beyond that, since the conversation is revolving around how am I doing, yeah. 
when the advisor is asked that question and they've identified the different strategies for different purposes, they can post reports on the client's online access to their accounts. Now, Merrill Lynch, we call that My Merrill. Other mm -hmm. firms have their own name for it. But the client can go in and see the report and see, oh, I'm 50% funded. Oh, that volatility was positive in 2013. Now I'm 62% funded. Mm -hmm. We got ahead of ourselves. Oh. Secondly, um, the portfolio review. Every advised client should have a formal portfolio review at a minimum of once a year. And that's an excellent time to sit down with your advisor and discuss any life changes that have happened for you since the last review, and also to review what the progress has been since the last portfolio review. Well, s speaking of life changes, maybe you could talk about how things can come out and disrupt such as disability, sickness, all kinds of you can have, people can all of a sudden find they don't have a job. How do you, as a wealth advisor, help the client when one of these things gets thrown in the path of actually achieving their goals? <laughs> well, we've had five years of that now. <laughs> Haven't we, <done>? <laughs> Haven't we <laughs> ever? <laughs> Yeah. And a lo as I said, whole careers were downsized. And we've done a lot of work working with our clients to provide safety nets. And sometimes that safety net, uh, while they're still working, they have not yet been downsized, is to um, redo the mortgage, get them to an interest-only mortgage so we can reduce the amount of cash flow flowing out. Uh, if they are already in a period of transition, uh, we do a lot of work with lines of credit against their personal assets. Uh, we do an awful lot in the area of long-term care coverage, sometimes for the client, sometimes for their parents. So we do a lot of contingency planning because life is an unknowable game. That's why I ask them to be upfront with me. <laughs> Pat, in the minute or so remaining, uh, do you try to pull the whole family into this planning? Uh, I know it's a tough thing to do to get the second and third generations, but it seems like that's an important thing to do. Actually, this shift in the industry, I think, is very, very beneficial for families. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the reason I say that, uh, and I do feel it's a permanent shift, it's not a fad, it's not something that'll be passing, is now more than ever, there is a need for a human connection Investors want to be heard. They want to be understood. Many have faced serious financial setbacks. Many are worried about whether or not they'll outlive their money and about their children becoming financially stable. A wealth management approach is a household approach. So you're working with the parents. You've done the same. And when they're working with an essential partner, they tend to talk about it. And then the adult children want this too, but on their own, they may not have the assets to qualify to work with a wealth management advisor. Right. But because we work on a household basis, we can include smaller accounts. Minimums are waived. They get the same break points on the fees that the parents get. So I see this spidering out through families. Excellent. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end there. I know we could spend a lot more time discussing this topic. Next week, our guest is Scott Mester from Sales Evolution. He's going to be talking about the sales process. Uh, and I also want to let you know that Money Matters is now available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. And for all of you who are radio listeners there, we want to welcome you. And the video is available on our YouTube channel as well as our website, www.money-matterstv.com. And from all of us here at Money Matters TV, your money matters. Roll the credits. Good show. Yeah.